I beg you to try it, Patricio. Let me get this straight, Carla. You disagree on the weapon, you disagree on the number of blows. <laughs> Listen to me, Patricio. You were there once in your life. Let us not assassinate this lad further, Senator. Let's, let's, let's You've go. done enough. Have right. you no sense of decency, sir? At long last, have you left no sense of decency? So that was a big moment at the Army McCarthy hearings in 1954. That was Joe Welch asking Senator Joe McCarthy, who was conducting a witch hunt against suspected communists. These were televised hearings, and they ruined people's lives. I'm telling you, they did. And uh, the have you no decency question, which was asked twice, lingered in the air over America for a very, very long time. And I think it it actually instigated the end of the hysteria about communists under the bed. So um, I, I played that for you today because I felt yesterday in watching the hearings in Washington, D.C., these were congressional hearings at which Matt Taibbi and Michael Schellenberger, two of the top journalists working today, <laughs> top five, I would say, uh, Indy, of course, because Indy media are the only ones actually committing journalism. Uh, they, they appeared before a subcommittee where they were pilloried, pilloried by people in government who didn't like their reporting, which impugned them. I mean, imagine that. So Michael and Matt were two of the people who went into the Twitter building in San Francisco, along with Leighton Woodhouse, who's been on the show a couple times, and uh, and also David Zweig, who's going to be our guest today, uh, to go through what became known as the Twitter files that exposed for the world to see what we all knew from the beginning. And that was that anybody who criticized certain COVID narratives, the only COVID narrative actually, was deplatformed and deprived of their right to speak freely about the COVID crisis. And one of the big names that they went after, obviously, was Alex Berenson. But they went after uh, Jay Bhattacharya and, and Martin Kulldorff and others. But what's interesting about the Twitter files is that it showed where the pressure was coming from, and it was coming from government agencies, right? That's what was happening. Somehow we live in a time where the government has convinced itself and government agencies think it's a good idea to be trying to control speech. Uh, I mean, this is this cannot end well. And what happened at the hearings yesterday exposed that in spades, it was so uncomfortable watching these, dare I say it, but they are nitwits, mostly from the Democratic Party, foolishly going after two of the world's top journalists, basically because they didn't like the reporting they'd done, right? And, and the Democrats are so used to nothing but favorable reporting that when you actually tell the truth, they melt down. That also happened this week when Tucker Carlson, as you may or may not know, dropped on his show some of the January 6th tapes that were released to him and that uh, tell a little bit of a different story. So they, they melt down, they panic, they wet the bed, you know, they do all the stuff that, 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 that they do when a party has been in power too long through corrupt means. And that's what we saw yesterday. We saw corruption on display. The idea that a, a, an elected member would have the gall to go after actual journalists for reporting things they didn't like. I mean, yeah, it was really, really bad, <laughs> really bad. I was actually feeling a bit weepy. And I'll tell you the point where I was feeling weepy when we get to that, that clip. But I want to start just by playing for you the opening remarks of Matt Taibbi. I have quite a bit of tape from the hearings for you today, and I'd really like you to stick around and listen because this is an historic event. And um, you'll know way more about the times we live in once you hear how 
absolutely absurd and ridiculous these people are while managing to be dangerous at the same time. So here is Matt Taibbi with his opening remarks from the hearings yesterday. Chairman Jordan, Ranking Member Plaskett, members of the Select Committee, thank you for having me today. My name is Matt Taibbi. I've been a reporter for 30 years uh, and a staunch advocate of the First Amendment. Much of that time was spent at Rolling Stone magazine. Uh, Ranking Member Plaskett, um, I'm not a so-called journalist. Uh, I've won the National Magazine Award, the I.F. Stone Award for Independent Journalism, and I've written 10 books, including four New York York Times bestsellers. (laughs) Uh, I'm now the editor of the online magazine Racket on the independent platform Substack. I'm here today because of a series of events that began late last year when I received a note from a source online. It read, are you interested in doing a deep dive into what censorship and manipulation was going on at Twitter? A week later, the first of what became known as the Twitter Files reports came out. To say these attracted intense public interest would be an understatement. My computer looked like a Vegas slot machine uh, as just the first tweet about the blockage of the Hunter Biden laptop story registered 143 million impressions and 30 million engagements. But it wasn't until a week after the first report after Michael Schellenberger, Barry Weiss, and other researchers joined the search of the files that we started to grasp the significance of this story. The original promise of the internet was that it might democratize the exchange of information globally. A free internet would overwhelm all attempts to control information flow, its very existence a threat to anti-democratic forms of government everywhere. What we found in the files was a sweeping effort to reverse that promise and use machine learning and other tools to turn the internet into an instrument of censorship and social control. Unfortunately, our own government appears to be playing a lead role. We saw the first hints in communications between Twitter executives before the 2020 election, when we read things like, flag by DHS, or please see attached report from FBI for potential misinformation. This would be attached to an Excel spreadsheet with a long list of names whose accounts were often suspended shortly after. Again, Ranking Member Plaskett, I would note that the evidence of Twitter government relationship includes lists of tens of thousands of names on both the left and right. The people affected include Trump supporters, but also left-leaning sites like Consortium and Truthout, the leftist South American channel Telesur, the Yellow Vest movement. That, in fact, is a key point of the Twitter files, that it's neither a left nor right issue. Following the trail of communications between Twitter and the federal government across, tens of thousands of emails led to a series of revelations. Mr. Chairman, we summarized and submitted them to the committee in the form of a new Twitter file thread, which was also released to the public this morning. We learned Twitter, Facebook, Google, and other companies developed a formal system for taking in moderation requests from every corner of government, from the FBI, the DHS, the HHS, DOD, the Global Engagement Center at State, even the CIA. For every government agency scanning Twitter, there were perhaps 20 quasi-private entities doing the same thing, including Stanford's Election Integrity Partnership, NewsGuard, the Global Disinformation Index, and many others, many taxpayer-funded. A focus of this fast-growing network, as Mike noted, is making lists of people whose opinions, beliefs, associations, or sympathies are deemed misinformation, disinformation, or malinformation. That last term is just a euphemism for true but inconvenient. Undeniably, the making of such lists is a form of digital McCarthyism. Ordinary Americans are not just being reported to Twitter for deamplification or deplatforming, but to firms like PayPal, digital advertisers like Xander, and crowdfunding sites like GoFundMe. These companies can and do refuse service to law-abiding people and, and businesses whose only crime is falling afoul of a distant, faceless, unaccountable, algorithmic judge. As someone who grew up a traditional ACLU liberal, this mechanism for punishment and deprivation without due process is horrifying. Another troubling aspect is the role of the press, which should be the people's last line of defense in such cases. But instead of investigating these groups, journalists partnered with them. If Twitter declined to remove an account right away, government agencies and NGOs would call reporters for the New York Times, Washington Post, and other outlets, who in turn would call Twitter, demanding to know why action had not yet been taken. Effectively, news media became an arm of a state-sponsored thought policing system. I'm running out of time, so I'll just sum up and say... uh, it's just not possible to instantly arrive at truth. It is, it is however, possible, becoming uh, technologically uh, possible to instantly define and enforce a political consensus online, which I believe is what we're looking at. This is a grave threat to people of all pers- political persuasions. Uh, the First Amendment and an American population accustomed to the right to speak is the best defense left against the censorship industrial complex. If the latter can knock over our first and most important constitutional guarantee, these groups will have no serious opponent left anywhere. If there's anything the Twitter files show, it's that we're in danger of losing this most precious right without which all democratic rights are impossible. Thank you for the opportunity to appear, and I'd be happy to answer any questions from the committee. Well, it was sort of all downhill from there, (laughs) because what happened, somehow certain people thought it was their role 
to badger, smear, insult, and bait Matt and Michael during this press. I mean, it was like the McCarthy hearings. It really was, it really felt like the McCarthy hearings. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. My friend C.J. Hopkins in Berlin, who thinks very much like I do and I like him, wrote a piece that just came out talking about um, how he felt like he was in some kind of a, you know, a hallucinogenic fever dream or something watching it happen. It's, it was just so bizarre that um, one's mind might not even be able to, you know, accept it, right? Their frontal lobes reject what you're seeing in 2023. So here's, this is a jam. This is uh, Stacey Plaskett, the ranking member of the House Judiciary Subcommittee, um, who uh, CJ said was attacking them like Joe McCarthy and drag. I thought that was a good line. Trembling with hatred. Um, she accused them of being members of some sort of substack based death squad that, in quotes, poses a direct threat to people who oppose them. I mean, really, two of the most skilled and prominent journalists working in the world today. And this is what the Democrats say, because they don't they're not comfortable with actual journalism. They don't want it. They can't face it because you know what? If journalism was actually doing its job, they wouldn't be in power right now, and they know it. So here is a clip of Representative Sylvia Garcia trying to get Matt Taibbi to reveal his source for the Twitter files. Yes, and I refer to that person as a source. So you're not going to tell us when Musk first approached you? Again, Congressman, when so you're asking me to, re- you're no. asking a journalist to reveal so a source. So then you consider Mr. Musk to be the direct source of all this? No, now you're you're trying to get me to say that he is the source. I, I, I well, just can't answer your question. Well, he is or he isn't. Source. If you're telling me you can't answer because it's your source, well, then that the only logical conclusion is that he is, in fact, your source. Well, you're free to conclude that. Well, sir, I just don't understand. You can't have it both ways, but let's move on. Cause well, no, he can. He's a journalist. No, he can't because either Musk is the source and he can't talk about it, or Musk is not the source. And if Musk is not the source, then he can discuss No one has yielded. The gentlelady's the out of order. You don't and get to she's speak. she's out of order because he's interrupted. The gentlelady's not recognized. You're not recognized. He's not, recognized. Recognized. He's not said that. I don't. But he has said is he's not going to reveal his source. And the fact that Democrats are pressuring him to do so is such an odd. We're asking him about his conversations with Musk. gentlelady has has not yielded you time. You don't get I have to not talk yielded over time her. to anybody. I want to reclaim my time, and I would ask the chairman to give me back some of the time because of the interruption. Mr. Chairman, I am asking you if you will give me the seconds that I lost. We will give you that 10 seconds. Thank you. That was Representative Sylvia Garcia of, of Texas. I mean, he's not going to reveal his sources. What, what are you doing? I mean, what? It just, it was just absurd. So the next bit I want you to hear, this is very interesting. This is very, very interesting. So Stanford University, which is the home of both Jay Bhattacharya and Scott Atlas, was helping to run some of the disinformation campaigns coming out of Twitter and the other social media sites. Imagine that this august center of learning. It actually doesn't surprise me because Stanford did not deal with Scott or Jay or Johnny Anides, I believe for that matter, in a respectful way when they pushed back on the original narrative. And they were right, by the way, that the, the university kind of lined up against them. And so um, I'm not surprised that they were doing this, but still when you actually hear about it, it's hard to wrap your head around the idea of a university actually promoting censorship. Here's the clip. I also found as a result of the FOIA, CDC tracks every tweet that a congressman puts out. Not just Republican, but Democrat. They keep a spreadsheet, they make it every week. Uh, This showed up in the FOIA for me because I'm in their spreadsheet that they track. Why is this interesting? Okay, so they're tracking congressman's tweets. At CDC, they're enrolled in the partner support uh, portal at, uh, at Twitter. And then I found, this is why, um, I found Alex Berenson's report very interesting because uh, what he found out is that Scott Gottlieb 
worked hard and, and Twitter complied, it looks like, to censor a tweet from a doctor about natural immunity. Guess what? On the same day that that doctor's tweet was censored, so were my tweets on natural immunity. Why is this important? What is, what is consequential about the date? This is three days after the military vaccine mandate came out and a week before the federal vaccine mandates came out. This truth was toxic to, to a narrative that Pfizer was spreading, that Joe Biden wanted out there so that he could force the vaccine on everybody, whether you had natural immunity or not. Now, I actually, you guys might not agree with me on this. I don't think the press gets special privileges on the First Amendment. I, think, I don't think Congress does. I think every American, by virtue of being an American, is, has the right to free speech well, enshrined in well, the Constitution. Well. So I'm not so much worried that they, they uh, censored a, a congressman, but they disabled all the comments from my constituents. Those are the voices they squelched. And my beef is not with Twitter, but my beef is with the CDC and these federal agencies. And I encourage you all, if you can, to find more about this. And uh, do you have any, either of you have any comments on this topic? Yeah, ab ab absolutely. The gentleman's time expired, but the gentleman may, may the, the Still witness had may three respond. seconds. The witnesses may respond. Okay. Just quickly, we, we found just yesterday a tweet from um, the, the Virality Project at Stanford, which was partnered with a, new, a number of government agencies on Twitter where they talked explicitly about um, censoring stories of true vaccine side effects um, and other true stories that they felt uh, encouraged hesitancy. Now, the important... The, censoring true. Yeah, so they used the word true three times uh, in this email. And what's, what's notable about this is that it reflects the fundamental misunderstanding of this whole disinformation complex, anti-disinformation complex. They believe that ordinary people can't handle uh, difficult truths. And so they think that they need minders to separate out things that are controversial or difficult um, for them. And that's, again, that's totally contrary to what America is all about, I think. I would just briefly add, this is very disturbing because what they're doing when they're putting these labels on there is they're actually also dis trying to discredit you. So it's not just, uh, it's a form of censorship, but it's also a, a disinformation campaign. And I think what Matt said is really important to understand. I mean, we went from, you go from a, a situation where we were fighting ISIS recruiting, and then it was Russian disinformation. And now they're in a situation where they're wanting to censor true information, accurate facts, because they're worried that people might behave in ways that they don't want them to. That involves mind reading at a level that is grossly inappropriate. I mean, I worry even about making this defense because let's remember, the First Amendment protects our right to be wrong. Mm -hmm. It protects our right to lie. I mean, it's bizarre to me that we would need to make a defense of the First Amendment and remind people that we have a right to be wrong. And being wrong, as Matt was explaining, is a big part of being a human being and having a democracy. So this is disturbing and chilling, and you're absolutely right to be outraged by it. There needs to be a full truth and reconciliation that I hope everybody would appreciate um, having on this issue because a lot of bad behavior has come out about what they've done. I mean, it's and I'm I'm looking at the the, the document that he is 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 talking about from Twitter, and it's it's shocking. Standard vaccine misinformation on your platform. This is from Stanford. The default posts on your platform spreading clearly false spearing vaccine misinformation that we believe violate your policies, known repeat offenders, false or misleading posts from well-known accounts such as Robert Kennedy or, J or Sherry Tenpenny. This is a large volume of content that is almost always reportable. True content which might promote vaccine hesitancy. I mean, and true stories of vaccine side effects. True posts which could fuel hesitancy. So they're censoring truth. And what I say about that, I mean, I think it's really a weird thing because if people are being injured by the vaccine, then then people should be hesitant about taking it, right? Like one thing follows the other. If people are being harmed by it, why would you not want to tell people about that so they can make an informed decision? I mean, that is Stanford, Stanford University. That's what they're saying in their virality project. That is why Matt is calling this a censorship industrial 
complex because there's a lot of people getting a lot of grants and making a lot of money from this. You got your fact checkers, you know, these grifty fact checker sites. You've got all of these universities now that are doing, you know, they have big special projects on this that are being funded and they're doing stupid stuff like you just heard from from Stanford. I mean, is that all they've got to spend their money on? It's just ridiculous. Isn't there a cancer they should be curing or something instead of doing this? Um, and then one of the other funny things that came out yesterday is the Aspen Institute, which is kind of the source of all evil. It's one of these kind of secrety, well-funded places where people who fly private go to, you know, hang out and look smart. They had a big project on misinformation with all kinds of massive censorship recommendations coming from it. And guess who was on the panel doing that work? Just, you won't even, you couldn't even guess. You couldn't even guess. <laughs> Prince Harry, right? Harry Mountbatten Windsor. Like he's a big expert on censorship and, and information. Like it's, it's unbelievable. And, and, and sadly, and Katie Couric, who I always knew was paid as well as she was because she is a she was a person when she was an anchor who was very good at looking like a rebel while never actually saying anything mean about the important people in the world. It was a real knack. And she, you know, there was a point where she was making, I think, like 20 million a year, some preposterous amount of money. And she married some big Wall Street financier, right? So she's part of the whole deal. They fly into Aspen in their private jets and they sit around and talk about how they can, they don't know they're doing this, but what they're doing is figuring out ways to quash dissent and criticism of the elite status quo. That's what they're doing, right? So yeah, he exposed that too. Matt Taibbi did yesterday. You know, it was a wonderful day in, in the sense that Matt and Michael Schellenberger who was at his side, who they seemed to pick on a little bit less, um, they stood their ground. And I was really proud of the two of them. They looked a little rattled. They also looked, they, I think there were parts of it they thought were quite bizarre and funny, but they looked rattled as I would be because, you, like I said at the top of the show, you can't believe this is actually happening and that they have so little self-awareness that they can't see that this video is going to live in infamy about them forever of the Democrats going after legitimate. She made jokes about, oh, so she called them so-called journalists. And what is this Substack thing anyway? I mean, they just have no clue. All they do is sit around listening, you know, to Don Lemon and the, the kind of halfwits over at, um, you know, MSNBC. I mean, this is the bubble they live in, right? So next, my final clip for you is going to be uh, of Debbie Wasserman Schultz. And it's a personal favorite of mine because she is harassing Matt about maybe making a living as an independent journalist. Listen to this. Rogan, yes or no? Yes or no? Yes. Good. Now, you crossed that line with the Twitter files. No. Elon Musk, it's my time. Please do not interrupt me. Alaskan, Elon Musk spoon-fed Elon Musk spoon-fed you his cherry-picked information, which you must have suspected promotes a slanted viewpoint, or at the very least generates another right-wing conspiracy theory. You violated your own standard, and you appear to have benefited from it. Before the release of emails in, of the emails in August of last year, you had 661,000 Twitter followers. After the Twitter files, your followers doubled. And now it's three times what it was last August. I imagine your Substack readership, which is a subscription, increased significantly because of the work that you did for Elon Musk. Now, I'm not asking you to put a dollar figure on it, but it's quite obvious that you've profited from the Twitter files. You hit the jackpot on that Vegas slot machine to which you referred. That's true, isn't it? I've also reinvested. You've made some. No, 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 no. Is it true that you have profited since you were, rece you were this recipient of the Twitter files? You've made money. Yes or no? I Very think it's probably question. a wash, honestly. No, nope. you, you have made money that you did not have before, correct? But I've also spent money that I didn't have okay. before. I just hired a I, whole a, group of people a to patently investigate. obvious answer, reclaiming my time. Attention is a powerful drug. Eyeballs, money, prominence, attention. All of it points to problems with accuracy and credibility. And the larger point, which is social media companies are not biased against conservatives. 
So, so what she just did there when she said money, you know, eyeballs, attention to impugn Matt, she's talking about every single anchor that worships at the feet of the Democratic Party. You know, I think Anderson Cooper's making like $10 million a year, never took a chance and gets most things wrong. I mean, it's just ridiculous. But why shouldn't Matt be making money? When I, look, Matt was on my show. He was one of my first guests, and I love him for that. And when, when he came on, it was three years ago, he was just really starting out in his indie career in that way. He'd written some books, but, you know, he was all of us who have given up other careers with regular paychecks to go into indie media. We take a big risk. We don't know if we're going to be able to make money. We don't know if people are going to like our work. We, we, we're, we're, we're just doing something because we believe in it, because working in legacy media or around that becomes untenable after you can't do it. And I, I remember asking him in the interview I did with him, you know, if his wife was okay with him going off this way. <laughs> and she said, yeah, now I'm sure Matt's doing well now. And he should, he should do well. It's America, right? He took a chance and he is doing well because he's very, very, very good at his job and people trust him. What an awful thing for her to do. And you know what I would have said that would have been mean. But I would have said, aren't you the woman who was fired from your job at the DNC because you rigged the election against Bernie for Hillary, which she did look it up. So these, you know, corruptocrats in there going after actual journalists, uh, 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 I'm sorry, like, they they held their own. I was so proud of both of them. And um, you should look for some more of the footage of it. So you can fully take on board what happened yesterday. But um, it was not a good day for democracy. Let's put it that way. Okay. My pitch, which is late in the show. I don't usually do it this late, but I got so carried away. So we have moved pretty much over to Substack. So don't follow us on Patreon as a new subscriber. Go to our Substack, which is Trish Wood is Critical. And understand, you'll get Substacks from me for sure. I love doing the writing, but it also pays for the podcast. We're just using Substack for all of our fundraising and support because it is a free speech platform. It's the same one that Michael Schellenberger is on, the same one that Matt is on. We're all on it now. Even Greenwald is on it. So um, please do that. And if you're on Patreon, try to move your account over as soon as you can. And if you have a problem with that, just get in touch with me, info at trishwoodpodcast.com. I've got uh, Dorothea and uh, she's wonderful at fixing these sorts of things. So do consider it. You know, you, we, I think we yesterday just proves the point even more. We have to support indie media. It is the only way out of this. There's no other way. They're not going to get better. They're not going to slap their foreheads and say, well, what the hell have we been doing for the last six years? We got to start being real reporters again. That's not going to happen. It's not going to happen for two reasons. Number one, they will not admit they made the mistake. And number two, you have a whole generation of young journalists coming up. Now we've got two different eras from J school where they teach that social justice should be the basis of all reporting. So that's not ending anytime soon. This is going to be a battle within legacy media for a very, very long time. They It needs to die, and then they can maybe rebuild. You know, maybe Matt will take over a TV network or something like that, or Schellenberger or one of those guys, you know, because this, this ain't working. It's not sustainable. And um, it's not going to end anytime soon because we've got another generation of J school kids coming up who have been indoctrinated. But um, but it is dying. There's no question about it. And you know how I know it's dying? And this is example number two, because people are peeling off, peeling, they're peeling right off. The viewership is gone. I think some people still watch it, even though they don't trust it just because it's a habit. Right. So we have to admit it's a new day. And that means that maybe getting your free, you know, newscast at night, um, maybe you have to give that up and start supporting people in indie media instead, right? I don't know how you do that. It's hard. Like I, I subscribe and pay for about 10 or 15 sub stacks, but I do that as it's partly a business expense so I can read them on your behalf. But I also feel like the people doing them work really hard and, um, you know, you can't expect people to work for free forever. So um, 
do consider supporting not just me, but the other people who are uh, toiling away in indie media right now, because yesterday we'll show you what they're doing. They're also starting all of these campaigns to monitor what we do and censor us and punish us. And the FTC is now involved against Matt and other people who were involved in Twitter. Imagine sicking the government. I mean, it's just unbelievable. So do understand the world we live in now that was illustrated yesterday in this terrible, terrible hearing. So now we're going to go to David Zweig for our interview. Lucky me. David Zweig was in Twitter with Matt and Michael and Barry Weiss. Get it. The people in, in the congressional subject, they didn't even know who Barry Weiss was, right? She was a, a big editor at the New York Times and they had no clue who she was. I mean, it's just hopeless. And they didn't know what Substack was either. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> okay. David Zweig is a writer based in New York. Invisibles, his first nonfiction book is an expansion of his acclaimed Atlantic article, What Do Fact Checkers and Anesthesiologists Have in Common? Invisibles generated press around the world with coverage in the U.S., Canada, Italy, a whole bunch of places. Um, and he also writes for The New Yorker, The New York Times, Wired, New York Magazine, The Atlantic, Boston Globe, Common Sense, The Wall Street Journal, Medium, lots of places, Salon. What's interesting about David is that he 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 was a COVID reporter for the last three years and he did a really good job and he managed to get his work into some major publications, including a great piece he did on undercounting or overcounting of deaths in hospitals, which I think ran in the Atlantic. So he's a, he's the real deal. He's a great reporter and uh, you should find his Substack also and check it out. And here is my conversation with David Swag. Hi, David. How are you? Good. Thanks for having me. I'm so glad you're here. Um, I'm a bit shaken up, actually. I just finished watching um, Matt and Michael being almost attacked by the people in the congressional hearing. It was it felt a little bit like a McCarthy hearing. Did you watch it? I watched a good chunk of it. It was really um, uh, combative. It was like strangely, um, yeah, very argumentative. I mean, I, I testified before Congress um, a year or so ago and uh, on, on school closures. And it was a similar vibe. I mean, the, the Democrats, one of them in particular, I forget her name, just really attacked me. So, you know, wow. they, they have, you know, obviously have a lot riding on this and whatever, through whatever means that they think is, you know, um, whatever, whatever they feel is important that's happening here. They, uh, they obviously feel it's important enough to attack the journalists. Yeah, well, I mean, it's not a good look to see in a democratic country uh, agents of the government grilling journalists for for committing journalism. I mean, it's pretty. I was, yeah, as I was pretty shaken up by it. I didn't like yeah, it very much, but ridiculous. I thought they yeah. held their own, right? I mean, I thought Matt was great and Michael was. They're both great, so I'm grateful to them both for doing it. You know, these things, and I, I was very. <sighs> I was really kind of saddened after I, I did my testimony. And, you know, this is a banal observation at this point, but I mean, you know, n none of these people actually really care. And, and I'm including the Republicans as well. Like neither, you know, and it's, you know, on this particular topic or any topic, these hearings are, it's a performance, it's a show, it's a play. And they, yeah. they, it's scripted ahead of time and there are actors or, you know, willingly or not in the play. And that's so, again, not that this is a novel, you know, uh, commentary on what happens in congressional hearings, but witnessing it, it's just it's it's a farce. Yeah. Well, it did seem farcical with a little bit of a an edge of danger attached to it. Yeah, um, that's a good yeah, characterization. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's how it felt. I wouldn't have liked to to be there. I, it's just I don't know. I I've been grilled as a journalist in court before, you mm -hmm. know, in in a lawsuit, and, and I had kind of the same feeling mm. as that. Yeah, they definitely got grilled. <laughs> yeah, they got grilled for sure. So I just want to first say that um, you know, so few journalists got co or so few journalists got COVID right 
that um, I, I have been admiring you from afar for getting so, so much of it right. I mean, you were one of very, very few. I don't know if you consider yourself mainstream. I know you're indie, but you write for mainstream publications, and somehow you seem to get away with quite a lot of truth telling. <laughs> My magic touch. <laughs> yeah, you did really well. So thanks for that. Um, I want to, I guess, start with the Twitter files because that's a really, it's a great story and it's also a fun story for me. Um, tell me just about getting the call and how that, I've talked to Layton about this a little bit. So, mm. so just tell me about getting the call and what it was like to hop on a plane and, and head out there. Yeah. Um, I, I know Barry Weiss. Um, I had written for her outlet before. And, um, you know, I saw that Matt Taibbi started releasing some of the Twitter files. And then I saw that Barry was named as one of the journalists with access. So I had just emailed with her and, and Emily Afi, an editor there, just saying, oh, hey, guys, you know, I noticed you have access to the files. You know, as you know, I've been, you know, whatever, writing about COVID for a long time now. These are some of the things I might look for and ask for, you know, in case you want to know. And I was sort of almost uh, apologetic, like, you know, I'm sure you're doing your own thing. And basically a short while later, I got an email from Barry. Can you drop everything and get on a flight to San Francisco? I was like, what? OK. <laughs> so that's sort of how it began um, for, for how I ended up there. Well, I'm uh, actually glad it happened. I'll tell you a little, uh, just sort of an inside story, because when when it was happening, um, I was talking to Jay Batacheri. It was the it was the night that Jay Batacheri showed up on Tucker. He just found out he'd been like blacklisted or something, mm -hmm. and it was a really big kind of moment seeing this obviously esteemed doctor finding out that what what he thought was true about censorship and Twitter was actually true. Mm. And I, I was dealing with him on a project I'm doing. And I said, boy, I hope if they, when they're going to do COVID in a big way that they, that they, um, that they get someone in who understands what the COVID journalism was about. I was worried they'd get a generalist in instead of a specialist. So mm. he said, no, don't worry. It's David Swag. It's going to be fine. <laughs> yeah. Because there's a risk in that, right? Because the generalists don't necessarily know where to look. You no, know? They were, no, you need to know. And I went there prepared with a list of censored tweets people that I knew ahead of time. And I basically wanted to just kind of reverse engineer what happened. That was my mission was, um, you know, I was looking for other things too related to government involvement. But for me, what's most interesting to me is just to kind of pull the, the curtains back and just, I wanted to get an understanding of well, what happened, what led to the circumstance where tweets that I knew were of, you know, legitimate, correct material. We're talking about tweets by doctors that, you know, where they were um, quoting from, you know, a published peer reviewed study, someone you know, uh, tweeting data from the CDC itself. And they were nevertheless flagged in one way or another, whether they were taken down entirely or labeled misleading. Um, an account was, was suspended from one of the people. So I wanted to go there and try to work backwards and figure out, well, how did that happen? I wanted to try to answer that question. Yeah, no, you did. And it's kind of like pulling the curtain back on the great and powerful Oz, right? Because, you know, we all, those of us who were getting COVID mostly right in our, in our reporting, um, I, I was very, very unsettled by the censorship, not just kind of generally censorship. I don't like it. But I thought, who's making these? Have they got some like 19 year old guy in a hoodie in Palo Alto <laughs> deciding what like science we're allowed right, to see? Right. You know, it was it was very disturbing. And then and I saw Vijaya on the Rogan show, too. And I didn't mm. like her very much. I, I thought her attitude about information was really scary. Mm. So you, you guys figuring out how this was happening was really, really important. It was such a public service because it exposed a lot, didn't it? I think so. Yeah, it really did. Um, I want to talk to you about how, how you kind of approached un, like unfolding the, the wrapping on this mm -hmm. is, is the place to begin the, the government asking them to do things or is the place to begin 
a culture within Twitter where they would be susceptible to government uh, pushback on various things. What do you think? That's a really good question. And that was one of the sort of things that we were discussing myself and Barry and, you know, Michael Schellenberger and some of the other journalists. The, one of the topics was, you know, how much of this story is about government interference? How much of this story is, is about, you know, just sort of peeking, you know, it, looking into the machine and just understanding, you know, what happened um, within, within the personnel of Twitter, as well as within the, the bots and algorithms and sort of, and ultimately the answer was kind of all three. There's a sort of, you know, the intersection between what certainly appears to have been um, a significant amount of government pressure on the company to do certain things to a very specific type of content. Um, but that was, but that's not the, the whole story. It's not just, you know, government officials stepping in and saying, do this. Um, that's one piece of the story. Um, but the other pieces are who works at Twitter or who did work at Twitter, you know, at that time and what, um, you know, what were their motivations and sort of what was their perception of what was reasonable or not reasonable to allow on the platform. And then the third thing is, you know, what mechanisms were used to police the content on the platform. Um, right. And that ranged from individuals making decisions to take things down. Certain tweets, you know, go all the way up to the top with executives deciding amongst themselves about what to do. And I have some emails, you know, back and forth about some Trump tweets at the time. And, you know, they were having discussions about what they should or shouldn't do with a specific tweet. Um, so sometimes it's that and other times it's a bot um, where they, you know, created these bot programs to, sort of, this might not be the correct metaphorical word, but to crawl through the platform and look for specific types of tweets that would get flagged based on, you know, s certain criteria that, that would, um, you know, trigger the bot. So um, it's the, the intersection of these different pieces together, um, I think, is what makes the story. The other interesting thing you said in the piece you wrote is that there there actually are guys in hoodies kind of in the Philippines or something being asked to figure out complex medical questions, which seemed really unfair. Yeah. So they had an interesting system where, you know, a lot of the, the content moderation was done offshore with, you know, just people in the Philippines and other places who presumably are just sitting in, you know, kind of a cube farm. And yeah. they had various sort of tools to aid them, these kind of decision trees um, that, that they would have to work through, I guess, you know, where it would say, for example, something like, you know, if the tweet contains the word myocarditis, click yes or click no. And then if you click less, yes, then that takes you to another, you know, drop down decision tree. Okay. Does it say, that it's caused by the vaccine? Does it say, you know, I mean, this is, I don't have those exact words, but that's how, how the decision tree works. Um, and I gave a, an example of one, you know, I showed what they look like and I had a long talk with one of the executives at Twitter about those decision trees and, you know, and how they would work. So, but ultimately, despite that tool that they were given, you, you know, th these are, really complicated topics. Yeah. Um, this is stuff I've been, you know, I'm on the phone with infectious diseases specialists and cardiologists and other people for hours and hours and hours. You know, I'm reading academic journals and I find it, you know, it, it's complex and challenging. There's zero chance that some, you know, person sitting, you know, in a cube in the Philippines is going to be able to adjudicate um, the veracity of a tweet about myocarditis. So uh, the, the whole endeavor in my mind was just inappropriate and doomed from the start for them to be making those types of decisions about complex um, public health and medical claims. Was there in your view, based on what you saw, an overarching motivation on behalf of government? Were they trying to kind of maintain a narrative at all costs. We saw that with Redfield yesterday saying about Fauci that the, 
he wanted to maintain his his narrative around it being an animal right uh transmission and then obviously with um the the lockdowns also that was also not a consensus but he wanted desperately Fauci wanted desperately for people to think it was so is that kind of what was going on here you think that they were kind of narrative stitching um by they you mean the government yeah the people putting the pressure on twitter and then twitter in responding to yeah, do it. yeah. I, I think that that's part of it it's hard to speak you know 100 percent to their motive um what I do know is there are emails internally characterizing the communications with people from the White House who were very angry. That's That was the terminology used. They were very angry that certain accounts weren't deplatformed um, for, quote unquote, misinformation. So, you know, and this related to the vaccines um, and other COVID related content. So. Uh, you know, th- these raise bigger philosophical questions about, you know, what, you know, we have the First Amendment. And I mean, a couple of things we know for sure. There's freedom of speech. Um, the second thing we know is a private company is allowed to do what they want. But the question is, you know, to what extent? What's appropriate? What isn't appropriate? I think most people don't want to be on a social media platform that's just like a complete cesspool you know, just with just absolute garbage, um, you know, floating around all the time, that would be an unpleasant experience. So we don't want that. But on the other hand, we don't want a circumstance where real legitimate information and debate is being, you know, squashed to some extent, which, you know, I believe my reporting shows that that was the case. Um, I don't know how precisely a platform you know, could or should find the right line. But I think my reporting showed that they were not on the right side of the line um, related to their how they handled COVID because there were just innumerable circumstances of accurate, legitimate information. And here's the thing that I think you were probably getting at, Trish, which is <laughs> every instance I found was information in one direction that was yeah. end up get, getting suppressed. Yeah. And this was anything that seemed to um, be contrary to what the messaging was from the CDC or the federal government um, on COVID. So anything related to, if someone wrote about natural immunity um, being effective, that could be flagged. If someone was saying something playing, uh, maybe I shouldn't characterize as playing down, but someone accurately presenting the low risk pro- profile for children that could be flagged if it's you know worded yeah. in a certain way because that was against some of the narrative. If people are saying you know something about myocarditis, other so in, in one way or another, so th- there uh, or other things that showed you know potential downsides of the vaccine. One of the tweets was of uh, there was a study that found low sperm uh, motility um, in people after they got vaccinated. Um, so. And that got um, flagged as misleading. And this was this was in a, a you know peer reviewed journal. This was in a published thing. Uh, so um, so time and again, the information that seemed to be suppressed only went in one direction, which was things that went against the narrative of the CDC. Things that you know anything that could be per- and 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 one of the Twitter employees even said to someone, our goal here, and I'm paraphrasing, but you know, they said basically our goal is to, you know, anything that might lead to more um, transmission or more exposure, we want to suppress that. And um, that that's um, that's the rough idea that they said. So it was it was quite clear that there they had a specific mission with, which aligned with the CDC's mission as I perceive it. And so the way to stop transmission is vaccines and lockdowns, right? So that's one thing follows the other. And if you criticize those things, right. you, yeah, you, all, you get it, Exactly, exactly. What so, interests me was the mm-hmm. level of, of um, how esteemed many of the people were who were being uh, censored and, and deplatformed and stuff. I mean, it, you should be allowed, it should be welcome that an esteemed scientist or medical person who's got a different opinion would be welcome on the platform, right? That's what science is about. So when I saw the great Barrington guys getting 
especially Martin Kaldorf, who's such a lovely guy um, and an esteemed person um, being deplatformed. I thought, what are they doing? Like, do the right. people at Twitter know better than, than Dr. Kaldorf does? I mean, that is the stuff that really made me a bit nuts. Yeah. You know, what's that saying about, um, I mean, I think part of it is not a purposeful thing as a, part of it. Some of it was purposeful, but part of it, I think also is, you know, that classic, uh, uh, statement about, you know, don't never attribute to malice <laughs> that which, uh, you know, is yeah. explained by stupidity. I think part of it just was <laughs> they had these systems in place yes. and, Maybe if they could go back in time, they would regret having Martin Kaldorf's, you know, tweets be be suppressed in some manner or another. But I think, you know, when you have bots that are trained to look for certain things or you have a person, you know, uh, an independent contractor who's, you know, God knows how many tweets they're pouring through every day and they're trying to figure stuff out. I think so it's more of like, you know, uh, a failure of the system. Um, now, I wouldn't just say it's accidental because, again, th- there was a particular narrative and a particular allegiance that Twitter had toward the CDC as the arbiter of truth um, on a lot of these matters. So to me, what, what's most upsetting is just the idea that if you disagree with this government entity, then that's misinformation. I mean, that's really chilling, um, that that idea. Well, it is for us as journalists, right? Because I, I kind of thought about this as I was trying to figure out what happened to the people working there. And I, I bear them no malice. But, but I will say this, that you and I and anybody who's been a journalist has a real feeling of ick about about taking at face value anything these powerful institutions say. We just don't think that way, right? We we think they need to be held to account. And and I started thinking here is this whole new interface full of people who have no journalistic training, who don't understand why we need to question these entities that are now coming in to this massively important as, as important as journalism, Twitter, and journalism is practiced on Twitter. Um, telling them that they cannot criticize the very things that should be criticized at a time when um, when massive freedoms and medical decisions are being made for for the country kind of on mass, right? So, in a sense, they they, they don't. I, I think they didn't think about it the way you and I do. Yeah, um, I think that's exactly right, what you're saying. And you know, in their defense, or this isn't a defense, but <laughs> they're not alone. I mean, you can read news articles every day in our most prestigious news outlets, and they're not questioning no. <laughs> things coming out of the government either. So You're um, right. I should have said independent journalists or whatever yeah, we're I mean, called. <laughs> you know, ultimately it comes, right. I mean, the purpose in my mind of a journalist is not to act as a megaphone for the government or some other entity, you know, mere, although that, that is an element of what a news outlet can do is to help project information to a large number of people. But, but that's only one piece of it. The other piece is to interrogate, to question, to drill down, to ask for evidence behind whatever the claim is. Um, and, you know, that has not happened in many, many circumstances, whether it's, you know, Twitter, but for me, you know, the, the larger issue is just in the larger media atmosphere. Um, yeah. And to this day, you know, that doesn't happen. So it's yeah. a remarkable thing to me. I think it just must be the how a lot of these people just must view their role differently from how I view my role and w- what's of interest to me. I'm like you, you know, I'm, my, my default is to always question, to be a bit of a cynic, to be, you know, someone who's, and at minimum, if not cynical, then at least curious and demanding of, of evidence for, for, for claims. And that's really absent, I think, from a lot of reporting. Yeah, it's been a really rough three years <laughs> for those of us who think critically. Um, I want to just ask you, and then I want to move on to your great story that you did, because I know we have limited time about Santa Clara. And there's a reason I'm mm. so interested in Santa Clara. But before we just move on to that. Mm-hmm. So uh, tell me, you arrive, where do you fly to? San Francisco? Is that where Twitter is? 
yep, San Francisco flew into SFO and, um, <laughs> And yeah, I'll, I'll tell you one thing, San Francisco itself, at least the area I saw is in rough shape. I mean, I yeah. live right outside New York City, so I'm in New York with some regularity. I mean, San Francisco is nothing like New York now. I mean, I had to, I, I'm a walker. I tend to walk everywhere if I can, particularly if I'm traveling and I'm somewhere new. I like to just see wherever I am from the, from the street level. Um, yes. so I try not, unless, you know, unless I really have to, I try not to take an Uber or anything anywhere. So I walked from my hotel to Twitter headquarters. It was probably about a mile, I'm guessing. Um, I think that's what it was. And yeah, it's like a 20 minute walk or something. And I mean, I had to walk through a gauntlet to, to get there. I mean, by, by the Second or third day, I, I almost I was very close to not walking anymore, even though that's my inclination, because it was just so unpleasant, bordering on potentially dangerous. The, the, I mean, there are people just literally right in front of your face smoking meth or crack or so. I don't know what it was, but, yeah, I mean, wow. um, just just an extraordinary amount of homeless people. Um, it's it quite remarkable. Is it really, um, that may not have been the answer you were looking for, but it sort of set the <laughs> backdrop to, um, <laughs> to the experience. It was really odd. Well, it, it, it is a bit of a backdrop because it does suggest something about a city and maybe even a country in decline. You know, I mean, it's just, I see the pictures out of there. Vancouver is getting a bit like that for the same mm. reason and other places mm. are too. And uh, it's very, very upsetting. I mean, I love San Francisco. I'm sure you do too. It's a great place. But I, I yeah, I've been there several times in the past, and and the Bay Area in general, and Berkeley and stuff. And and I love it there. This yeah. this particular trip, I was, um, I did speak with someone there, and they said, ah, that's just like the area you were in. It's like the absolute worst. But yeah. nevertheless, I mean, I guess what's different is in New York or some cities, this an area that might be really loaded with with crime or, or or just you know um kind of a a really undesirable um um environment with tons of um homeless people everywhere and you know drugs being taken right in the middle of the street and stuff like that um that's typically not in a major business area at no. least in, in my experience and what yeah. i found you know it's, it's somewhere else what i found surprising and unusual is you have these you know major corporations, you know, with headquarters there, or at least their, you know, big offices. And then it's like right outside the door is just complete chaos. It's, it's a, a little bit of hyperbole. It wasn't chaos, but I mean, it, it, I am not um, exaggerating to say that I had to walk through like a gauntlet of, of people, you know, doing drugs and, and whatever else. Like you could not, the sidewalk was just teeming with them every day. Wow. It's pretty wild. So it is wild. Yeah. Yeah, well, I um, finished up a doc, a doc just before COVID when everybody got locked down and I was traveling, but I'd been in, in and out of Seattle a lot for a documentary I was doing and and um, it, it was it was getting that way too. I was in good hotels downtown. I always like to have a bit of a shop up on my day off if I was away from home a long time shooting. Mm. And um, I mean, it was getting bad. I, apparently mm. it's much worse now, but it was getting bad. What a shame because Seattle is also a... A great, yeah. great town. So, okay, so let's move you through. I just want you, I want David approaching the Twitter building, going upstairs. Were you greeted by Elon or how did that work out? What happened? No. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was funny. But, you know, this is pretty much, it, all of this was very like last minute, very just trying to throw it together. Um, the night before, I, I remember texting Barry. I was just like, um, how do I get in the building? She's like, oh, right. Yeah, let me like text someone, <laughs> some security person. Will try. So I arrived. Yeah, and there um, it was kind of interesting to get upstairs to Twitter. There wasn't there wasn't even like there. there's a security desk, but that's not who I was supposed to talk to. There was a woman who you know, was just kind of like standing there, almost like appeared to be loitering. And, and she had, you know, I don't, I don't remember, like a lot, you know, a, uh, like a iPad or some sort of device. Maybe it was just her phone, but she's, I had to go through her. Like you never would have known even to get, it was, it was quite interesting. I don't know if that's like a purposeful thing or what, but it was not someone behind a counter. It was like a special person <laughs> who then, 
gave me, you know, access to go upstairs and then upstairs there's multiple layers of security to go through, you know, several doors and get a special pass. Then I had to get a different pass. And then ultimately I finally ended up, uh, in the room that we were given, you know, all the shades are drawn. The door was to remain closed at all times. Um, and that's where we kind of hunkered down. I was only there for three full days. So, um, and the type of research and, you know, digging and searching that we were doing was very challenging. So it was actually, you know, ideally, you know, I could have stayed there for two weeks. Um, just because it, it, each one of these searches we were doing, it's not like you could just say, give me everything that shows whatever, you know, <laughs> yeah. you have to really think through how to search for things, what to ask for. And then once you ask for it, a lot of these things took a long time before they came back to you. So, um, you know, it's quite, it was, it was a really interesting experience. Well, I think you I said this to Leighton, I think you guys should do a movie, you know, like spotlight mm. or something. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it'd be very cool. Wouldn't that be fun? It should happen. Yeah, Leighton and I, I guess, would be bit players, you know, relative to, to Matt. Um, <laughs> yeah. And then yeah. to a lesser extent, Michael and Barry, Michael. I guess. But, you know, this is really Matt's project, I would say, more than anyone, of course. He's but a I good was... guy. He he was like my third guest on my on my podcast when I oh, started cool. it three years ago. Yeah, oh my God. he's Yeah, he was so lovely. This is really, the Twitter files, obviously, in the, is Matt Taibbi. But I'm... I'm really glad that I was able to contribute, you know, and do, do my part. Historic, with it. historic, yeah. historic yeah. moment. Absolutely. Yeah. It's so great. So great. So we're running out of time, but I do, I don't want to let you go until we just do a couple minutes on this great piece you've written about Santa Clara. And here's why I'm asking you about it, because we're doing, I'm doing a film with Jay and Scott and a bunch of people at Stanford where there was a fair bit of misbehavior around the work that they were doing and the position they took during COVID. And, and, and I mean, it was really kind of strange. Um, and, and also today it came up with Matt that, that their virality unit um, was saying we must censor all vaccine criticism, even if it's a true uh, mm. problem, we can't talk. I mean, it's just weird. And mm-hmm. then when I read your piece and, and it said that Santa Clara County was very COVIDian is the word I use. Um, mm. It makes sense in a way that the bad things that happened around Stanford and and um, and and even the Santa Clara study that was done early on about the infection fatality rate makes sense that it things went awry because it was in this very very um, aggressive. I think is the word used aggressively kind of COVIDian. So just, we've got only a few minutes, but just give, tell me the story quickly because yeah. it's, it's remarkable. I mean, it's, we're spying on a church, right? Yeah. So first of all, all the listeners go to davidswag.substack.com yes, do. for the story. Yes, yes. Most importantly, come to my Substack, subscribe, even just for free. Um, so yeah, so I wrote this for my Substack and um, I, basically expose something that to my mind is quite extraordinary, you know, in an alternate universe, this would be on the front page of, you know, New York times. I mean, this is, it's just an amazing, amazing story where the Santa Clara County um, health department, this is for people who don't know, Santa Clara is sort of the heart of Silicon Valley and um, in Northern California. And they launched basically a a multifaceted surveillance program um, against a church and its members for for a long time, for many, many months, maybe more than a year or so, if I tally everything up, um, where they were there in person. They they, um, ultimately, they got a restraining order from a judge that empowered them to go inside the church. And they were in there monitoring people and, you know, pretty intimate, um, uh, events, you know, something like a baptism and, and private little prayer groups, you know, and there are these health inspectors peering in, seeing if people are wearing a mask or if someone's singing, um, if they're distanced enough from each other. So you have people from the government, like coming into 
a church and, 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 you know, insisting upon monitoring people. Um, and then I have lots of, of screenshots from these declarations in the court documents, because there are two lawsuits related to this now. Um, that's, that's how I sort of built my story off of these incredible court documents where you just have these insane reports written by these um, enforcement officers where they, you know, it's like, you know, officer so-and-so and I entered the premises. We observed 12 adult females, three of which were not wearing a mask. Two people hugged. One of them was singing. You know, I mean, it's and it's just it's that over and over and over again. So it's, it's quite remarkable that this was happening in America. Um, they also when they were barred from the premises prior to getting this restraining order, um, they spied on them from the church next door. They peered at them through a chain link fence and did the reports <laughs> that way, talking about um you know, the, the, the traffic uh, guards in the parking lot not wearing a mask and things of that nature. Um, and then the third piece is they used um, mo- mobile uh, cellular mobility data. They tracked the, the mobility data of people going to the church. They set up this thing called a geofence, which is basically a digital border around the church property. Um, and it was so granular that they even not only could they track the number of people going into the church property, they tracked people going into individual buildings within the church property. Um, wow. And they hired this guy from Stanford to then run an analysis of, of this mobility data and produce a report. So this was I mean, it, it's it's really a breathtaking story that yeah. this happened. It's it's yeah. bonkers to me. I like, can't believe this happened. Um, I mean, the story's done quite well. I've gotten some attention, but in my mind, this should be like exploding everywhere yeah. um, because it's just completely crazy. Well, and what's interesting about it is, uh, well, many things are interesting, but but is, is that the people, the congregants were, many of them went back to church against, you know, the rules uh, because they were just not dealing well with the isolation. It was it was almost like they needed to go back for, you know, for their mental health and maybe even to save their lives. That's right. Well, that's the irony. So you have these, they were breaking regular orders, you know, there are these public health orders. They were, they were not complying with them, but it was the very public health orders that were forcing them to not comply so for some of these people. It was, you know, the order, the isolation um, for some people, uh, people because of the broader societal shutdown, many of these people, you know, including several people I interviewed lost their jobs because their place of business closed down. So you have someone who's struggles with alcohol, um, needs support for that, loses his job, told that he has to stay home, can't be with other people. You got to have your face covered. Everyone else needs to have they, there. And this wasn't for a week or a month. I mean, this churches in Santa Clara County were barred from any indoor gatherings for seven months. Wow. Um, it's just, and I'm not a religious person myself, but, um, but to me, that's besides the point. You know, this this is a story about, American citizens who are given the right to practice the religion, they are, have the right to assemble. That doesn't mean that, in my view, and others may disagree with me, it doesn't mean that public health authorities should have zero ability to, um, you know, to impose some sort of measures on society. But 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 that should be something that's under an extraordinary circumstance that is extremely brief, in my view. Now, people can argue about what what is brief and what isn't, but seven months is not brief. Human beings are not meant to be isolated. Um, I appreciate how the public health authorities want, of course, wanted people to limit their exposure to each other to try to reduce the likelihood of transmission. But as I note in my piece, there, there was a, um, a pretty amazing differential between the rules imposed on churches versus 
retail stores and malls, yes. for example, yes. you know, there yes. was a moment where the church wasn't allowed to be open at all, but malls, you know, I think they were allowed to open to 50%. And then when the church was finally allowed to have some people at 25% or, or capped at a hundred people, whichever was fewer, um, there was no limit at all to go into a mall or retail store. So it's, if they were truly concerned about transmission, it's hard to believe <laughs> that they would come up with with rules in this way. I saw some people on Twitter were complaining, well, that's because in a church, people are singing and they're close together. But what people don't understand about these, about implementation science and with, with mitigations like this, these sort of what are called NPIs, as you know, these non-pharmaceutical interventions, is that the more time that goes on, the less effective they are typically, the less yeah. people are able to comply with something. Even if they want to comply, they can't. And over a period of time, these, these interventions become less and less effective. So people, regardless of whether they were going to church, were going to become exposed. And then finally, at a certain point, it's up to them. You know, I understand we want to have a limit on exposure. No one's forcing people to go to church. They needed this. There's some of this, uh, there was one gentleman I spoke to who became suicidal. He was oh. going through a really dark time. And while I don't rely on the church for this, some people do. And he needed that church community that he was a member of. He needed to be there in person with these people to help him get through. Um, and, and the government banned that activity. And, you know, I, I end my piece saying, look, um, if a public health intervention, or for that matter, probably any government, you know, law, you know, imposed by the government, but particularly with something like public health, if it winds up forcing a, a significant number of good people to become criminals, then then maybe there's something wrong with this intervention. Then something's wrong that it's not effective. That some, something's not working here. And that's exactly what happened in Santa Clara County. It's an amazing story. Uh, and you have this, you painted this image of these people, the, the, the enforcers sort of peering through a chain link fence at their prey. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's just ridiculous. The other side of the story, too, is that in those churches, many of them that were closed were AA meetings, too, which were closed mm -hmm. throughout the world. And people need those, too. And, uh, and many, many people relapsed because they wouldn't let that happen. It's just, did you, did, was there any self awareness at all in the documents you saw? Or are they self righteous about what they did? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, I was mostly focused on the enforcement officers declarations. <laughs> yeah. So with there, it, it's pretty dispassionate. It's neither righteous nor, okay. so it's just like, this is what we, you know, this is our work. This is what we're doing. This is what we observed. Um, mm -hmm. and there were multiple times where they talked about, um, how they commended the, the people at the church next door for following orders, you know, so that, oh. um, which was, which I found amusing. They said, you know, when, they, when they, this church next door for, for gave them permission to use the property um, to do the spy operation. The spy. And they Look. said, you know, as we went there, you know, and they said, we commended them for, for not holding their indoor gatherings. Um, it's funny that they included that within their, declaration. I don't know why that would be relevant, but anyway, I, th I found that amusing. <laughs> well, yeah, it's amazing. It's an amazing piece. And I'll say I found it because um, my friend Chris Bray, who writes on Substack too, wrote a whole piece about your piece. And, oh, he did? Oh, uh, yes. cool. Yeah, he's a terrific, if you don't know who he is, he's a great, great writer. You must take a look. He was really praising, praising it. So that's how oh, I... that's great. Yeah. And I will also in our... Um, blurb for the show. I'll put your Substack link Please in there do, too. So yeah. people, yes, of course I will. Anyone think, listening, come yeah. to my Substack, davidswag.substack. Yeah. Well, they will anyway, just, I think just because the, I know the people who listen to the show are always wanting to find new indie journalists to, to follow. So thank you very much. That's me. It, it's an amazing story. It's crazy. I have some other interesting stuff coming up um, soon as well. Some of it related to that and other not. So, um, yeah. Thanks for having me, Trish. It's good to, I'm glad we were finally able to connect. Yeah, me too. Me too. So um, have yeah. a good rest of the day and keep on going. You. Your work is terrific. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Trish. I'm really glad we were able to talk. Okay. Bye, David. Bye. So that was my conversation with David Zweig and do look him up on Substack.
So one of the other moments from the hearing yesterday was Matt Taibbi talking about how the FTC was now targeting journalists. And it it was really a moment. Here's the clip. I have to get to a question I'm amazed hasn't been asked of the two of you. This FTC consent decree, where it is government action subject to rigorous scrutiny under First Amendment standards, government action demanding that your names be listed. How did it feel when you found out that you were being expressly targeted by a government document based on your reporting? It was chilling. I mean, it's disturbing. I I never thought that would happen in the United States of America, to be perfectly honest. I've been in a bunch, I've lived in a bunch of authoritarian countries, I've visited a lot of authoritarian countries, never thought this kind of thing would be going on here. And the nexus to authoritarianism is the desire to control the nature of truth itself. Our understandings change about things. We learn new things. We challenge prior assumptions. But if a bunch of people in Washington, D.C. get to decide what the truth is and then enforce it on the country and then punish and target those who report on their conduct, we are drifting more toward that. How did you feel, Mr. Tybee, when you saw your name? I was uh, upset, obviously. Um, I I lived in uh, Russia during the 90s and early 2000s. I was there when Putin took power. I was friends with a group of uh, very brave, uh, muckraking reporters in Russia, many of whom didn't make it. A few of them um, were murdered after Putin came to power. So I've always been conscious of how the risks that other reporters take in other countries are incredibly severe. And that's one of the reasons why I'm motivated to protect the First Amendment, because our, our country has the best protections for reporters in the world. Um, but this kind of thing, where the government is looking for information about reporters, it's usually a canary in the coal mine that something worse is coming in terms of uh, an effort to exercise control over the press. And so on that level, it's, it's absolutely disturbing. Also, the Aspen Institute report that we, we uh, published today, uh, talked about today in the Twitter files thread, um, ex- one of their recommendations was that the FTC be empowered uh, to get uh, to have unlimited power to search uh, all data of uh, private companies, so that they could more freely and more accurately search uh, the speech of ordinary citizens. So, so as we're ge- trying to put downward pressure on the government's expanding authority to be able to engage in what we see mostly from dictatorships, what you're reporting and what you're observing is that actually they view this as a growth industry, the information business, right? This, this yes. censorship industrial complex is a growth industry to the government. I think the key thing also, yes, and the thing to understand is that NSF... Is new, how, what is NewsGuard, and how are they part of the censorship industrial complex? Yeah, and we, by the way, we talked about Richard Stengel. He's on the board of NewsGuard. NewsGuard and the Dif- Disinformation Index are both U.S. government-funded entities who are working to drive advertiser revenue away from disfavored publications and towards the ones that they favor. This is... Uh, now, you totally know, what I'm used to in this town is government officials pick their favorite outlets and they give them the best scoops and they give them the best stories. And there's a fusion of media and government that has long made me uncomfortable. What, but what you're describing now is literally the directing of revenue to certain media companies over other media companies designed and implemented with U.S. government funding and support. That's right. I, that, that is an astonishing way. If we do not take a look at NewsGuard, we, we have failed. And you talk about the brave reporting that occurs and what it subjects you to. I would suggest there is also political bravery that I have observed. While we've only heard from Democrats on this panel attacking you, discrediting you, a lot like they've tried to attack and discredit FBI whistleblowers who are truth tellers, there are brave Democrats who still believe in free speech. And I would advise my colleagues to look at the comments of Ro Khanna, who has been deeply, deeply concerned about this weaponization of government. And he believes these Twitter files are indeed worthy of our focus and our energy. And that is exactly what we are going to do. I- yeah, I have to say Ro Khanna has emerged as a bit of a hero in all of this. So the two reporters speaking was Matt and Michael Schellenberger. So that's pretty scary, right? The FTC. We have this new phrase now, which we all must embrace, and that is the censorship industrial complex. And I'm going to play you uh, President Eisenhower giving a warning about another industrial complex, that the censorship industrial complex, and I think the pharma industrial complex, is going to eclipse pretty soon. So with that, I will say stay critical and see ya. From the White House in the office of the President of the United States, we present an address by Dwight D. Eisenhower. This is the farewell address for President Eisenhower, whose eight years as chief executive come to an end at noon Friday. Mr. Eisenhower has chosen this time for his final speech. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Good evening, my fellow Americans. A vital element in keeping the peace is our military establishment. Our arms must be mighty ready for instant action, so that no potential aggressor may be tempted to risk his own destruction. Our military organization today 
bears little relation to that known of any of my predecessors in peacetime, or indeed by the fighting men of World War II or Korea. Until the latest of our world conflicts, the United States had no armaments industry. American makers of plowshares could, with time and as required, make swords as well. But we can no longer risk emergency improvisation of national defense. We have been compelled to create a permanent armaments industry of vast proportions. Added to this, three and a half million men and women are directly engaged in the defense establishment. We annually spend on military security alone more than the net income of all United States corporations. Now this conjunction of an immense military establishment and a large arms industry is new in the American experience. The total influence, economic, political, even spiritual, is felt in every city, every state house, every office of the federal government. We recognize the imperative need for this development, yet we must not fail to comprehend its grave implications. Our toil, resources, and livelihood are all involved. So is the very structure of our society. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. We should take nothing for granted. Only an alert and knowledgeable citizenry can compel the proper meshing of the huge industrial and military machinery of defense with our peaceful methods and goals, so that security and liberty may prosper together.